Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Mara Gittleman. I am the workshops and education coordinator for NYC Parks Green Thumb. Welcome to the Tomato Heaven webinar of the Green Thumb Grow Together conference. I'm so excited to be here with Maureen O'Brien and from the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes. We'd love to um, have you go head over into the chat where you can introduce yourself, let us know who you are, if you're part of the community garden, where you're tuning in from. This workshop is being offered with simultaneous Spanish interpretation. So if you would like to hear this webinar in Spanish, you can click on the interpretation icon at the bottom of your video screen. And we are recording this workshop. So if we will have the recording focused on just the speakers, but if you prefer to have your camera off, that's fine too. There's a little camera icon at the bottom of your screen as well. So we're really excited to be here with Maureen O'Brien, who is the community field manager at Brooklyn Botanic Garden. She loves growing, eating, and teaching about tomatoes. I'll also say that Ms. O'Brien has been teaching this workshop at Grow Together for many years, and it's always a hit, it's always so popular, and we're so excited to be able to offer it virtually this year. Ms. O'Brien is also crazy about compost and is a community garden volunteer in South Park Slope. Welcome, Maureen, the mic is yours. Thank you so much, Mara. I'm so happy to be here. And also thank you to Bill Losasso and all the amazing uh, people who uh, work with Green Thumb and support uh, community gardeners. Um, I also wanted to thank all the gardeners who are here today. It's just great to see all these familiar names and faces and feel uh, connected to each other uh, at this virtual Grow Together today. Um, so I wanna take a moment to uh, just, let's have a collective deep breath. Big inhale and nice big exhale. And that also kind of reminds me to um, I have some gratitude to my ancestors, to my parents, to my family, to all you gardeners who I've learned so much about growing and being inspired and growing tomatoes. So thank you all so much uh, for that. Um, so today I, I know that some people have chap typed in the chat where they're from, but I just wanted to get an idea maybe if, um, if you're wherever you're tuning in from if you put it on gallery view and let's just see uh, like a show of hands of who's here today so how many people are here today from the Bronx if you're here from the Bronx maybe raise your hands or give a little okay I see some action out there from the Bronx all right welcome um, how about people from Manhattan if you're from Manhattan give us a wave okay I see some I see some action over there liveliness in Manhattan. Okay, people from Queens. I know there was someone who wrote in the chat. Other people from Queens? Great to see you here today. How about gardeners from Staten Island? Do we have any Staten Island folks in the house today? Okay, I can't see all the, the gallery, so uh, welcome. Uh, how about people from Brooklyn? Okay, Brooklyn Botanic Garden. It's in the house, so shout out to uh, everybody from Brooklyn. Good to be here with you. And how about people from outside New York? Is there anyone outside New York who's coming in? Well, actually, I'm actually in Pennsylvania today, so I'm tuning in from, from uh, snowy Pennsylvania. Uh, good to see everybody here, and feel free to type in the chat where you're tuning in from today. So, um, so we're here today, you know, to talk about tomatoes and starting them from seed. And one thing I wanted to start out by saying is like, I really, 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 really love tomatoes. I love tomatoes. I love eating tomatoes. I like looking at tomatoes. I love looking through tomato seed catalogs. But most of all, I love eating tomatoes and sharing tomato plants and tomato as food with other people. Um, so in addition to tomatoes being so amazing and wonderful and delicious, they have a lot of health benefits. So tomatoes are full of vitamin A, vitamin C. They have antioxidants and anti antioxidants are really good for fighting free radicals that can cause medical problems. 
Tomatoes also have lycopene, and lycopene is important in preventing heart disease, arter arterial sclerosis. Um, it helps prevent uh, prostate cancer and breast cancer. Uh, lycopene also helps our cell walls. So it's really important to main maintain the walls of our cells, especially when we're getting bombarded all the time with toxins trying to get in and uh, damage cells. So lycopene is super important. Uh, it is also thought that lycopene helps prevent premature aging. So another important thing for skin. And tomatoes are also really low in calories. They're beautiful, they're delicious, and they're part of our history. Okay, so um, maybe we can have this in the chat. Why is growing tomatoes from seed important to you, to you specifically? So think about that a little bit. Why are you here at this workshop today about starting tomatoes from seed? Um, let's see, maybe we could have a couple ideas that are in the chat. So we have more variety, love growing heirloom varieties. more affordable to start that way, can give them away to others. It's so interesting to grow varieties that aren't locally available, organic. I like being involved in the food I feed my family. I can choose different kinds, way better than what you get from the grocery store. Plus it's satisfying to eat something you started from seed and can share with other people. Another vote in favor of heirloom tomatoes, or if I have a tomato I love, I can use the seeds next year. Let me know when you want to stop, want me to stop. Those that sounds good. That sounds like a lot of really amazing and personal uh, reasons for starting tomatoes from seeds. Uh, different varieties, not available in the store, to save money you know, for your family. Also sometimes to continue a family tradition if seeds have been passed down by other people or friends or gardeners, um, to make sure your plants are organic from the start. And um, I loved hearing that idea about uh, growing more to share with neighbors um, and the different varieties. Um, and a lot of times I think also tomato plants that are available commercially, uh, there are maybe not the most delicious ones. So um, I agree with all those ideas and I encourage you to keep putting ideas in the chat as they, as they come up. So uh, what kind of tomatoes should you grow? I mean, there's so many kinds of tomatoes. Uh, so and we're gonna look at some, some different types of tomatoes. They kind of fall into like four different categories. There's cherry tomatoes, paste tomatoes, slicing tomatoes, and beefsteak tomatoes. So here, is, here are some chocolate cherry tomato seeds. Uh, cherry tomatoes are usually kind of small. They're really kind of condensed sweet flavor and they ripen uh, like first usually. So also in the cherry category, but a little confusing are pear tomatoes. So these also are small pear-shaped tomatoes, super delicious, easy to pop in your mouth when you're just like out there weeding. Then grape tomatoes, which are shaped kind of like grapes, but they're tomatoes. They're also in the cherry tomato category, uh, intense flavor. Sometimes people cut these in half too and dry them for sun-dried tomatoes. And these I love. These are Little Bites cherry tomatoes. These are good for containers and small spaces. So they're really prolific. Tomatoes generally need a lot of space to grow. And so matching a container tomato with a small growing space is, is, a, is a, a way to kind of guarantee that you're gonna have success. Um, then there's the paste tomatoes. So paste tomatoes, also called plum and sometimes Roma, those are good for making tomato sauces. They're a little bit drier and meatier. Um, so that would be something like San Marzano is an, a variety. 
Amish paste tomato is one that I've been growing that I really like and is very prolific. Then there's slicing tomatoes. Slicing tomatoes generally are kind of a more uniform round shape and they're good for making sandwiches. Uh, you know, they can kind of fit easily on a regular sized slice of bread. Uh, they're good for making uh, caprese salad, like, you know, the mozzarella tomato salad with basil on it. It's kind of the same size as a mozzarella ball. So this is a good all purpose tomato as well. Then we have the oblong shaped big tomatoes, the beef steak. So these are, you know, uh, there's heirlooms in every variety of tomato, but this is like um, a brandy wine. This is re a red and yellow blend of Brandywine pole beefsteak tomatoes, super delicious, really complicated flavor. Also, this is a big beefsteak that I love growing. It's Paul Robeson, uh, named after Paul Robeson, the famous activist uh, from Victory Seeds. This is a really reliable, big, big, big heirloom, uh, tends to not crack and delicious flavor. And then Cherokee purple. I think this is my favorite um, beefsteak tomato. I really love them. A very whiny, uh, complicated taste. And I feel like when I eat uh, tomatoes that I've grown myself, you know, in a month like February, if I go, well, I don't go out anywhere, but if I did go out anywhere and get a sandwich, I would never ask for a tomato on it because they just really taste like nothing compared to these. So basically when tomatoes are not in season, I tend to not eat them. Um, so, so what kind of tomato you like to eat is kind of a good way to think about what you might wanna grow. Do you want them for snacks? Do you wanna make sauces? Do you wanna make tomato sandwiches, BLTs? Do you wanna stuff them? You know, Think about what is the right kind of tomato for, for you for how you might wanna use them. Um, do you want them to ripen all at once um, or over a whole season? Do you wanna sell them at a farmer's market, give them to friends, make a beautiful tomato display that you can photograph? Um, I do think that you know cherry tomatoes are super delicious and they're really cute, but they do take a longer time to pick to get you know, a good amount of them compared to like a beef steak, which is like the largest. Um, at nurseries, like we kind of said before, at nurseries, farmers markets, hardware stores, and garden stores, there's usually not that much choice. So uh, starting tomatoes from seed is important and they do, it does take a little bit of special care. And some of that is because tomatoes originated in way warmer countries, like closer to the equator and South America, where it's sun, 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 and warm, warm, warm soil. So we don't really have that in New York City, especially right now, if you just look out the window, it's not sunny and warm. Um, and this is really the time to get started uh, with tomatoes. So uh, in, the, in New York City and in the Northeast, we need to start tomatoes indoors so that they'll have time to grow and set fruit and ripen and we'll get an abundant harvest. If we started tomatoes outside in the garden soil, then by the time they get big enough to start setting fruit and uh, harvest, it's too cold and then it's over. So it's very important to start them inside. Um, let's see, in general, for me personally, I like to plant mostly beefsteaks, especially the Cherokee Purple, Paul Robeson and Black Crim. Uh, plus, I like to plant a couple of plum tomato plants so that I can make tomato sauce to can and then have in the winter time. So this year, one thing I'm going to try that's a little different is I'm going to try a determinant uh, kind of plum sauce tomato. Determinant means they ripen all around the same time, and that's good for doing projects like canning or making ketchup. Indeterminate means they, you can't determine when they're gonna be ripe to harvest. So that tends to be tomatoes that they ripen over a longer season. So determinate is all at once and indeterminate is like little by little. Um, then I almost always have one or two cherry tomatoes uh, so that I can share with my grandchildren and also with children that come to the garden, the community garden to visit because it's just so easy for children to pick 
uh, cherry tomatoes. And it's just so much fun to see people be delighted being like, oh, wow, that tastes like really good, you know, and especially if it's a juicy, you know, like a chocolate cherry or something that um, seems almost like candy. So um, that brings me a lot of joy. So, you know, think a little bit about what kind of uh, tomatoes you'd like to plant this year and as far as how they match, how you might uh, uh, use them. Think about that for a couple of minutes. Um, I'm gonna just start sharing my screen here. And okay. And we'll just go over a little bit about, again, so here is, let's see. Can everybody, can, can everybody see my screen okay? Okay, got it, okay. So we're gonna go clockwise here. So these are green doctors. This is a beautiful cherry tomato that's kind of a green, yellow, almost chartreuse. Uh, this gorgeous thing here is a gold and red striped, uh, striped Roman paste tomato. This is Clackamas blueberry, which is a medium sized tomato. We grow this at the Botanic Garden. It's almost blue black. And inside is this like really rosy, juicy red color. Um, I'm making myself hungry here. Oh my gosh. Uh, okay, right down we ha here I have a gold metal beefsteak, that oblong, and you can see the fluted shoulders here. And then in the middle, this is a slicing tomato or particularly beautiful one called Berkeley tie dye which has these red and green stripes and it's, it's ripe when it's green inside with this like rosy core. And then we have grandfather ashlock, which is another beautiful beefsteak. Okay, so now we're gonna get into some of the nuts and bolts of how to get these little wonderful seeds to turn into plants. Okay, seed starting supplies. So gather all your supplies together uh, we'll need some sterile soilless uh, potting mix, uh, clean containers. So you can use new containers or old containers or cups or yogurt containers with a hole punched in them. They should be clean. So, um, you know, it's important to have uh, wash them with hot soapy water or some bleach water before reusing to make sure that there's no uh, you know, bacteria or fungus there that could spread to your seedlings. Then you're going to need some, some water. Um, uh, room temperature water is usually pretty good. Your seeds, a pencil, some plant tags, and a drip tray, and then a, a bowl or a bucket and a shovel. Since I was doing this inside and home, I just used a big mixing bowl and a spoon. So again, we're talking about starting inside for plants like uh, tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, which just need a long season. Okay, the sterilis, the sterile soilless medium mix. It's really important to have it be sterile because if you include soil in the mix, soil has all kinds of uh, beneficial bacteria and fungi in it. Yet when you're starting inside, um, those soils can kind of like almost start to feed on the little seedlings. So if you've ever experienced, you're like, you have your tomato seeds or maybe pepper seeds and they're growing like straight up and they're doing like really, really good. And they're like growing up and so proud. And then one morning you come down and look at them and they're like, they're all slumped over like this, like just right like this, right at the soil line. Well, that's called damping off. And that's caused by uh, soil bacteria and fungus. And what happens is that they start kind of right at the soil line, they're starting to like eat into the tomato a little bit. So if you look when they're slumped over, you can see it's like a little skinny shape. Um, and that of course is no good. Your tomato is like done for. So to avoid that, use the sterilist, sterile uh, soilless potting mix. Um, and also one thing we're gonna talk about later is always watering from the bottom. So you can buy these mixes um, at a nursery or a hardware store or, or order them online. Um, I like to use the organic ones. And you can also have your own homemade mix, which is one part coir or peat, one part sand, and one part sifted compost. So I like to use coir, the coconut coir, because it's more sustainable. That's a, it's a byproduct of the coconut industry um, rather than use peat, which is a unsustainable 
uh, resource. Moisten, so add water little by little to your soil mix until it feels just moist. So it should feel like a wrung out sponge with no drips. So just add the water little by little. So here's a shout out to uh, Green Thumb staffer Lillian Reyes for this wonderful idea for how to make a, a water container by poking little holes in the top of a milk carton top. Or uh, we uh, drilled them in with a, a one eighth of, no, I think one sixteenth of an inch uh, drill bit. Uh, Lillian kind of heats up a nail and kind of melts that in, but you can make a fine rose uh, with an ordinary uh, uh, milk bottle. Uh, so the rose is where the water comes out, and that's nice because you can have just a little bit of water at a time come out to moisten your soil. You don't want the soil too wet. Okay, so here it is. It should be moist like a wrung out sponge. So when you squeeze it in your hand, if you see uh, moisture kind of welling up in between your fingers, like tears, that's okay. But if it's dripping, like drip, 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 falling off, that means you should add some more soil. It's important that the soil's not too wet because if it gets too wet, it'll get like too compact and we want it kind of moist, but light and fluffy. So there's plenty of room for the plant roots to grow. If it's too wet, just add some more soil. Okay, so fill the container. Gently kind of, you know, spoon or shovel some uh, soil into your container. And I like to just pat, pat, pat the sides so that the soil settles in there. Um, it's important not to like squish or compress the soil too much because once the seeds start growing, they want lots of space to uh, be able to grow their roots. And actually they do need a little bit of oxygen in there. So having some light airy spaces is perfect for the, for the rootlets. Okay, so before you actually plant your seeds, it's very important to make out the plant tags because all those seeds look pretty much the same once they're in the container and especially once the soil's over top of them. So uh, there's plastic uh, container, uh, plastic uh, labels and wooden labels. I like to write the name of the variety and the date and any special things like when I should transplant them by. So these, all the tomatoes that you're going to be seeing today were planted on uh, December 15th. Okay, next, insert the plant tags first and then plant two seeds right in the middle of each cell. So in the center is ideal. You, you can always reposition them with a pencil if they kind of go off, the, off into the edge, but really you don't have to sweat it. And I usually plant two because once um, the seeds germinate before they get transplanted, I usually thin it down to one, uh, the strongest transplant. So two is ideal just so that you can ensure germination. Um, then after the seeds are in the center and you know right there on, on your wet soil, sprinkle a little bit of dry soil over the top. I use the seed packet as a guide for how deep to cover the seeds. In the case of tomato plants, it's most seed packets say an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch. Um, and just, you know, just sprinkled on very lightly. If there's any chunks, break them up. Uh, next is watering from the top. So uh, place your container inside a drip tray or in a bucket or something like that, if you, you know, cause you'll be inside and then using a fine rose on a watering can or your own homemade, just brush over the top back and forth just to very lightly moisten that soil. You also can use a, a spray bottle like this to moisten it just mist on the top. This is the only time that you're ever gonna water from the top when you have your seedlings inside. Um, so be gentle with that water because you don't want the soil to get dislodged or the seeds to be like floating around in there. The water actually acts as a catalyst to wake the seeds up from dormancy. So when the seeds start uh, absorbing moisture, it's called imbibition. 
And that is a, that the water is a catalyst there so that the little tiny embryos that are inside the seed start like unfurling and waking up. Uh, so now's a good time to, your seeds are planted, your tags are in there. Uh, move your just planted container to a sunny spot like a windowsill where the seeds can germinate. Um, a windowsill for tomato plants is ideal, although tomato seeds do not need sun to germinate like some seeds do, like um, uh, Nicotiana, the flowering tobacco, those seeds need to be on the surface um, to germinate. So you could have uh, less light, but the one thing that's good about having a sunny windowsill is the heat because tomatoes love heat and so the sunnier the windowsill, the more the soil will heat up and the faster the germination will be. So uh, tomatoes like peppers and eggplants, they love warm soil and they do actually really like some bottom heat. Uh, this is, speaking of bottom heat, this is a heating mat um, and it, it uh, you know, plugs in, it's very low voltage, it just, you know, uh, they're made specifically for starting uh, seedlings. And this will definitely uh, get your tomato seeds to germinate faster. It takes a while uh, if they um, don't have a heat mat. Yet, I, I, this is a pretty new thing for me, having a heat mat. I thought I'd splurge since I'm growing a lot of tomatoes. Uh, but they do like a warm location. And another place that you could do inside the house is like on the top of a, of a refrigerator, kind of towards the back where it can be a little bit warmer. But you know, if it's back there, make sure it doesn't get too hot and um, don't forget about your seedlings up there. Uh, never put it on a radiator, that's like way too hot. Watering, okay, so the, the seedlings until they, or the seeds until they germinate, they should have kind of an even moisture. So they shouldn't be sopping wet. They shouldn't look all glossy, but they should be watered regularly, like maybe once a day, maybe once every other day until they germinate. So always water from the bottom because we want to prevent that damping off disease. So um, everybody, uh, even though I know you're all muted, just repeat after me, always water from the bottom. Okay, one more time. Always water from the bottom. One more time. Always water from the bottom. Okay, so fill a tray with water, uh, move your little seedlings into it, and then allow the moisture to like wick up into the, into the soil in the container. And let it sit there for a minute or two, and then drain it off and put it back in its sunny spot. Uh, here we are, um, the moisture is wicking up into the soil and then it's okay to move it back to its original spot. So again, everybody, do we water from the top or where do we water from? Okay, always water from the bottom, very good. Okay, then in addition, every two weeks, use a double diluted fertilizer uh, of fish emulsion or compost tea to fertilize the seeds. And just do that in, uh, as your regular watering, just add the, the diluted uh, fish emulsion or compost to the water that you're watering the seeds. And of course it should be from the bottom. Ooh, germination. Okay, so finally one day you'll wake up and the seeds will have germinated. So you'll see the little, the little leaves or, or stems kind of popping out of the ground. So when that happens, um, definitely move it to a sunny location when you see the sprouts and then rotate every day so that the seed, seedlings grow more evenly. This is also a good time when you can start to kind of stroke or pet the, the seedlings just very lightly brushing over the top of your, your um, with the top of your hand so that they develop strong stems. See here you can see, this is a, a, a little bit later. These are the same seedlings. They're in a sunny location. I'm about to rotate them. And you can see these leaves right here. These are the cotyledons. So that's, these are the, the what was covering up the seed, the, the embryo inside the seed. So those are the first leaves that unfurl after uh, underneath the seed cap. 
Then these teeny little leaves that are right in the inside here, those are called the true leaves. So that's the first true leaves. They look a little bit more like tomato plant-ish. Um, and then they're coming out here. This little thing here, you can see they're more round shaped cotyledons. I know that that's a weed because I only planted my tomato seeds in the center, so I can pull that out. So with kind of this seedling care right now, we're just gonna keep, uh, keep them in the sunny spot, keep watering every couple days, except now you can let the soil dry out a little bit. Um, it doesn't need quite as much water because the seeds are already woken up. They're out of their dormancy and they're growing. So the soil surface should not be dry per se, but just let it dry out a little bit um, in between. Continue petting or stroking. Uh, when plants are inside, they don't have those natural breezes to like kind of toss them back and forth and give a little resistance. So that, that petting really is important for growing uh, strong stems. And uh, sometimes I have been known to sing to my tomato plants and other people tell me it's very joyous for them and it also does help grow really good tomatoes, but that's optional. Okay, so now we see the same tomato plants. We can start seeing the true leaves here, which looks more like an actual tomato plant. Um, here you can still see on this one that there's still a little seed cap on there, um, but the tomatoes are doing really good. You can see kind of like their little hairy stems. They have little nodes all over the place. Um, and then these ones right here, these are Paul Robeson beefsteak. So once you, these true leaves are important. Once they get about two sets of uh, true leaves, it's a good idea to step them up into bigger containers so that they can grow uh, to be a little bit more robust. Uh, right here, you know, there isn't that much soil here. It's only like about two uh, cubic inches. Okay, so here is a stepped up uh, tomato. Um, this one does only have one set of true leaves, so I apologize about that. I thought I was running out of time. Uh, so I stepped it up a little bit early. It should have two sets of true leaves. But for stepping up, I took this little seedling uh, out of its little cell, uh, put it into a three to four inch pot with some more moistened potting soil and um, gently transplanted it into its own container. If uh, there had been two seeds in here, I would have just cut, clipped out the other, the other seedling with a pair of scissors, kind of sacrifice the weakest one and just plant the strongest one. Um, so this will grow to be bigger and more robust with the extra room and you know, keep petting it, keep watering it from the bottom and singing songs to it. Uh, as it as it grows and keep it in the sunniest spot or if you have no sunny spots but use um, grow lights under the grow light. Okay what's next? Oh okay all right I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Okay all right so so now we fast forward a couple weeks and here's our little tomato plant okay so here we have that same tomato plant that we were looking at. And then right here, this is also the same thing that was on the windowsill. Uh, these were planted, so they're getting kind of like gangly here and all out of control. But I just want you to look at the difference in the size of these tomatoes. So these only had a small amount to keep, a small amount of soil to keep growing in. And these, because they got stepped up into a, a bigger container, you know, they got pretty big and tall. So, um, you know, that's just important because when you plant them out, you really want a nice robust uh, transplant so that it'll be okay to acclimate um, to the outside. So we've done the planting, germination, uh, stepping up into this container. So now I'm going to ask people to just, um, you know, use your imagination to kind of fast forward. We're not in February anymore. We're not in March anymore. We skip April. Now we're in May. Okay. So we're already in May. Yay. Springtime. So 
you can start planting, you can start transplanting tomatoes usually mid-May, like around the 15th or something, but they, um, we've been having such cold, wet springs recently that I've been tending to wait until the last week in May to transplant. Tomatoes really, really like that warmth. And so if it's too cold and you plant them out, sometimes they turn kind of like this purplish color because they get like too cold and they never really, you know, bounce back after that. So I think it's better to plant a little bit later rather than earlier and then they'll catch up. So, you know, this is a pretty big tomato plant. And, you know, the tomatoes of course have been, they've been living inside. They've been getting special attention. They have a New York City apartment, which is maybe 70 degrees inside. And now they're gonna be going outside. So it's important to do a step called hardening off. So this is acclimating your, your tomato plant to the conditions outside. So you can start by opening the window where it is to let some cooler air inside. And then after that, on a overcast or a cloudy day, you can take your tomato plants out and they can go on a little field trip outside, like outside your, your window or in your backyard or in your community plot for like an hour and then bring them back inside. So then the next day, it's like two hours outside and then bring them back inside. So little by little, they're getting acclimated to the outdoor conditions until they're pretty much outside all the time. And then it's time to transplant them. So if you didn't do the process of hardening off, um, they could go into transplant shock. Um, and that's not good because then they're not gonna do well and not produce well. Uh, so again, when you start taking them out, it should be an overcast day. If the forecast is for like blasting sun for like a week ahead, then you can still put them out, but it should be in a shady area because if they get blasting sun, they'll get sunburned. The leaves will turn white, will be in shock. You know, they won't, they won't like it and they won't do well. Okay, so let's just say uh, we're at that part. We're in the last week in May. Let's just pretend that this is already hardened off and we're going to plant it uh, in the garden. So I'm gonna go back to this, these other extras. So I like to plant uh, tomatoes and I, I learned this from reading and also from uh, other gardeners at community, community gardens, planting deeply. So all along the tomato stem, there's these little nodes that will grow more roots. So when I plant something and I'm going to, I'm going to say like no tomato plants will be harmed right now, but actually this is going to like not look so good because I'm going to just pinch all these tomato leaves off the sides. And you might think I'm being really cruel and horrible, but there's all these nodes there and I want to expose this. So now it kind of looks like a, you know, well, it's a plucked tomato plant. So I'm, I'm taking everything off except for the very tippity top leaves like this. And so I'm going to plant this deep so that the whole stem except for these leaves is underground. So what's going to happen then is that the underground stem will just grow all these roots and they'll just make a big, big, thick stemmed plant that's gonna be able to get a lot more nutrients from the soil and produce more fruit. So the ground outside is frozen. So I wasn't able to take any pictures of digging a big hole and planting that, but I did plant in this, this tall container. I planted one of those transplants and you could see that just the top leaves are sticking out. So everything else underneath there, I just pinched off the other leaves and then transplanted it carefully in here. This is just simulating like planting it in a deep hole in your community garden bed. Another thing that you can do besides digging a deep hole, like I was thinking, well, like this one is like so tall. This is like, I'll have to dig a 20 foot deep hole. Another thing that you can do that, um, I've been told they do a lot of time in the Caribbean is dig a trench. So dig a trench about six inches deep, pick 
the edges off and then just bury it in the trench and just gently turn that top couple leaves up and have that growing up straight. Um, so I think that's pretty much it. We're the, the, I think we're, we're planning on having other workshops afterwards to talk about other things like mid-season tomato care, how to save tomato seeds, uh, maybe some ways to cook tomato seeds. But as far as from starting to starting from seed to hardening off and then getting ready to transplant. Oh, one thing I wanted to say, when I do dig the hole or trench, I water it well, like maybe two or three times. I like to put a handful of compost in there, uh, some crushed eggshells. If you don't have crushed eggshells, you can use a Tum tablet for calcium. I like to put a rusty nail in there I guess that's for iron and uh, yeah. And sometimes I just put the compost in there, um, but uh, that, that helps with getting it with a really good start. So watering the hole, a big hole, I like to say dig a $5 hole for a $1 plant. So you, you want the, the hole to be big so that the roots can spread out. And then when you backfill it, just do it very gently. It's kind of a, combination of like firm enough that the plant isn't going to like be like floating all around like this uh, but not too firm that the roots are compressed and can't kind of grow freely so i think i think that's kind of uh it for we're i'm ready for for questions and to to hear more from people thank you Wonderful. I will start reading questions. Um, this might be a little self-serving, but there was one about chocolate tomatoes, the chocolate cherry tomatoes. Um, I want to grow chocolate cherry tomatoes this summer. Any special care or advice on how to grow them? So I think um, just the same for um, for all the tomatoes. That I would say like for tomato plants, they really want the sun that the the spot in your garden that has the most sun and heat so they want sun 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 if you have less than ideal sun then growing a smaller variety like uh, like a cherry tomato will help you get some fruit and also if you have a small if, if you have less than ideal sun tomatillos are a little bit uh better for that and um and container uh cherries or patio tomatoes they don't actually taste like chocolate. They do taste very good. They're like more chocolate uh, colored and nice and whiny and delicious. So I guess also uh, building off of that, uh, someone asked or says, I don't have a sunny window, so I use fluorescent lights. Is that good? Or do you also, there are also other questions about, do you have suggestions uh, for using a grow light? Do you use indoor growing lights at all? If so, what kind? Yeah. Um, I don't, I know we use them um, at the Botanic Garden. We have a grow light set up because we start so many um, things from seed for the, the children's garden. Um, I don't personally use them. I did one time use a, like basically a light from an old fish aquarium that I rigged up and moved it like for a fluorescent tube. So I don't have firsthand experience with that. And actually I don't know about growing um, to full harvest size with fluorescent lights. I imagine that's something that if, if you look for research online, there must be places that are growing like commercially in the winter time um, for that. But I would say for me, I've just been, you know, growing in um, the sunniest spot in my community garden plot. We had some questions about how to avoid mold or fungus in the seedlings and how to avoid fungus gnats. How to avoid fungus nets, yeah. Um, so I would say good air circulation is very important it, for when you're starting from seed and also from when you're they're out in the garden. So garden uh, tomatoes need a good amount of space and they need a lot of air circulation because they're really prone to all kinds of wilt diseases. So having good good spacing, don't crowd your tomatoes. Like, like if you had a little pot and you put 10 seeds in there and they all start growing, you know, they're more likely to get a fungal thing. Also don't water from the top. Um, and 
you know, if things look too wet, just let it uh, dry out. Uh, fungus nets, I'm trying to think, um, you know what, I, I recently had a, a student in the Brug program who had a solution for fungus gnats and I just, I can't remember it. I can't remember what it is. Maybe it'll come to me. It was something like, you put this on it and if you put too much, it'll actually cause fungus gnats. But if you just put a little bit on it, it'll get rid of fungus gnats. So um, I'm sorry, does anybody else know the answer to that question? Maybe put it in the chat. Oh, so there are mosquito. Uh, mosquito bits you can use for fungus gnats? I'll jump in too. I've been battling fungus gnats over <laughs> here in my apartment um, and it's like been a, a topic of conversation amongst Queen Thumb staff. Um, I tried the mosquito bits. They did not work for me. Um, some of my coworkers have tried a top layer of like two inches of sand and that's worked for them. I've started using yellow sticky traps and that's finally what's worked for me. Um, but I know some people who have gone you know, full steam ahead and, and purchased commercial chemicals, um, mm -hmm. but I, I haven't quite gotten there yet. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, uh, one time I did have like some kind of little flying insects. I don't really know what they were. And then I didn't want to buy those yellow sticky traps, but I did put Vaseline on yellow cardboard and that seemed to work to trap uh, things. And, and also the sand, sand is good. Sometimes if you if you wanna start seedlings and top them with sand, that also can help with um, damping off. And we're seeing kitchen, things you can find in the kitchen, cinnamon, apple cider vinegar. Oh, cinnamon. And dish soap. Cinnamon is the thing that uh, the bug student said. Yeah, a little cinnamon water can, can help with that, yes. Oh, thank you, Karen G. <laughs> um, when you replant the seedling for the first time, are you still using a soilless mix or potting soil? Yes, yes. So if it's if it's if it's inside, and actually, I only step up once. Like for example, this this second thing that we did, this was just like a pretend thing because we can't be outside and the soil's still frozen. Yes, yeah, so I use a soilless mix. Uh, we have a question about yellow pear tomatoes. I've heard yellow pear tomatoes are prone to splitting. Is that accurate for New York? You know, splitting, that's really interesting. I haven't heard that specifically about uh, yellow pear tomatoes, but you know, the last couple of years we have gotten like, like rainstorms where it just like rains and rains and it, it just, and there's so much splitting that happens. So actually I, like to um, really keep an eye on the weather, both so that my tomatoes get enough um, uh, water. And then if there's gonna be a lot of rain, I've kind of experimented with um, harvesting tomatoes when they're just starting to um, blush a little bit, so they're not fully ripe. And that can be helpful for if the rain is happening so much and also to, um, if there's problems with squirrels, because sometimes if it's uh, squirrels like to take, or, or I'll just say other animals like to take a bite of a tomato and then just leave it. And sometimes it's because they're thirsty. So if you harvest them a bit early, as long as they have a little bit of red color and blush, they'll, they'll continue to ripen inside. Uh, there was a question about the type of sand. Does it matter what type of sand is used? Can be any type. Do you have a type? Um, I've used sand. It's kind of, I think it's usually called play sand or washed sand from a hardware store. I wouldn't use sand from a beach because that's probably too salty. Um, and I think there were a bunch of questions about timing and um, really like regional timing rather than um, a month because we have people tuning in from all over. Mm -hmm. um, and forgive me if this was covered, but is there a certain time that you would start in order to get these plants out and ready and being enjoyed in time for summer? That's, that's a great, a great question. Uh, you know, because I started these in December, that's way too early to start them if you're going to be planting them out in New York City. And one of the things that there's uh, often tons of information uh, is on your seed packet. On the back of the seed packet, it might say something like, um, you know, start, uh, you know, start eight weeks 
ahead of time inside. So that would be start your plants for two months before you plan to uh, plant them uh, outside. And I usually add a couple of days for like slow germination and hardening off. So I think that, um, you know, now we're like in February, like if you start tomatoes in March, then planting them in mid uh, May to late May is usually a good. Oh, do you stake the tomato plant when it's outside? That's a great, that's a great um, question. And, um, and Mara, and that one um, tip sheet, there is a URL for staking ideas. There's like free, I don't know if that's gonna be in the chat or what, oh, here it is, the garden trellis. So this has like all kinds of uh, great trellising ideas. I, I have used like every kind of staking method. I usually try to do the cheapest one where I don't have to buy anything. Um, but I did invest recently into rebar because they're really strong and then have a wooden frame on the top. And I use uh, twine to tie on the top of the rebar and go down and then kind of like twirl the tomatoes up it. And th there's pictures of that on, um, that trellising idea, but like the cages and things like that, I, I just find that, um, well, I, I think that they work good. It's just, I try not to buy things. So, um, <laughs> but definitely stake your tomatoes because they'll, they'll, if they're on the ground, they can kind of get like dirty and start to get moldy. And you really want that good air circulation. So I find like um, wrapping them around, uh, you know, twining them. Actually, that was one of the things that I actually forgot to say here. This has a little stake in it. It's just like a little um, uh, bamboo oh, stake. And I have it tied with um, these very soft ties which are one of my favorite garden things. This is a pantyhoe. So these are pantyhoe loops. And it's really easy to, to just tie, use these pantyhoe loops, or you can even cut up like old socks that have holes in the bottom that are soft to attach that to the stake because it won't, it won't harm the, um, the stem. Um, I have a question. Do you need to water every day once the tomato plants are big? Uh, what well, uh, you should let the the soil dry out in between watering, and to tell if this if it needs to be watered, if you touch the top of the the surface of the soil, if it feels cold or wet, you probably don't need to water. But if it feels like dry or hot, uh, you can water. And once you have a little bit more experience, you can um, kind of learn that if the if the plant is in the garden. I would say if you stick your finger in and up to your first knuckle, if it feels cold or wet, then it's okay. If it feels dry or um, uh, hot, then it needs to be watered. Do you have suggestions for seed sources? Seed sources, yes. Um, so saving your own seed is great. Uh, also, trading seeds with your neighbors, with other gardeners, because you know a pack of tomato seeds depending on the variety there can be, or, or the, the company, there can be a lot of seeds in it. And tomato seeds do last for a long time. So uh, companies that I like a lot, I really love uh, True Love Seeds, which is a company in Philadelphia. And actually Owen Taylor, who's taught workshops in New York before, he's gonna be teaching a seed starting workshop at Making Brooklyn Bloom on March 20th and 21st, a little plug for Making Brooklyn Bloom. His seed company has really beautiful and amazing um, seed varieties. I also like uh, Botanical Interest, uh, uh, Fedco, Victory Seeds, um, let's see, who else? Renee's, Renee's Garden Seeds, also great. And I, I don't have any examples of it, but I like um, high mowing seeds. They're from um, Vermont. And like, for example, Renee's seeds, they donate a lot to the Botanic Garden. And, uh, you know, that's fantastic, but they are on the West Coast. So True Love Seeds is in Philadelphia. 
Hudson Valley Seeds is in upstate New York. They have great tomatoes um, and their, their tomatoes are kind of grown out and they're saving seeds from tomatoes that have grown in our kind of conditions in, in New York. So um, the more kind of local the seed, the better it is, I think, for growing in our climate. And I think at the, it also on the Botanic Garden, there's a blog that I wrote last year on um, uh, testing your seeds for germination. And there's a, a bunch of seeds uh, there, seed company recommendations there as well. There was another question, I guess, about keeping them healthy and preventing or getting rid of tomato hornworm. Oh, tomato hornworm. Oh, that's one of my favorite topics. And actually that tip sheet has a picture of a tomato hornworm covered with these little white spiky things, which are um, egg masses from, um, uh, from beneficial wasps. So, so it's very good to like go out in the morning, look at your tomatoes, see if there's any pests on it. And if you see a hornworm, you can just pick it off by hand and throw it into soapy water, or maybe just put it up on a little stake and keep an eye on it for some bird to come and snatch it up. Uh, if you see the ones that are covered with these little white egg cases, those are very beneficial and you don't want to drown that hornworm. It's better to just like move it to a different place or put it in a jar so that then those beneficial wasps can um, hatch. So what they do is they hatch and then they eat the hornworm. So, I mean, I know that's pretty horrible and gruesome, but it's kind of cool too. Uh, do you recommend soaking the seeds in water first to quicken the germination time? Um, you can do that. I tend to not do that with, um, with seeds with tomato seeds, I tend to do that more with bigger seeds. Like if it's a pumpkin seed or peas or beans, sometimes I soak them overnight. Um, but I do know that there's many people who do soak seeds even, actually Chris Bolden Newsom, who, okay, he's gonna be presenting also at Making Birth and Bloom. He, certain seeds that he saves himself, he puts in his mouth and has them get some saliva on those and then plants them. And that's just part of the, the ritual and blessing and uh, gratitude for having the seeds and kind of getting them to be a good start. Um, let's see. Uh, more about uh, the watering uh, component to it. Do you remove, I guess, remove the plant from the water tray between waterings um, or do you let them sit in the water? You definitely remove it. So they should only sit in the tray of water for like three to five minutes until the moisture wicks up into the soil and then take it out, you know, let it like dry off until you put it back on the windowsill. So they should definitely never sit in standing water. Though if that happens, there's so much water that then the roots will start rotting and then the plant will die. So I think that's all the time we have for questions today, but please check the link um, that I put in the chat. Maureen is going to um, join us over in the conference Slack lounge to continue the conversation. So if we didn't get to your question, please join us in the Slack so that um, we can be sure to get that answered for you. And thank you so much, Maureen. This presentation was amazing. So informative, so fun. It was great seeing plants also, like tomato plants. I haven't seen a tomato plant in so long. So thank you. Um, and thank you to our interpreters, Washington and Anna, you guys are amazing. Thank you so much.